Hello students, welcome to EPG Patshala. I am Dr. Vibha Dhawan from Terry. Today we are going to talk on module Cell and Tissue Culture under the paper Plant Biotechnology and Crop Improvement. In this module, you will learn the vast variety of tissues that can be used to initiate cultures. Cultures which can be classified as unorganized callus and suspension cultures and organized type which is organ culture. And we will be concentrating more on how to grow cell and suspension culture. You will be learning later the term totipotency and that is that each cell has capacity to form a complete organism. And it is that callus can be formed from any cell that is de-differentiation of differentiated cell to form an unorganized mass of parenchymatous cells which then can be induced to form a plant. But these callus cells they can also be used then to raise single cell suspensions, mass of cells which can then regenerate or we can also use them for other purposes like secondary metabolite production, studying the cell behavior and so on. Now coming to callus, as I said it is an unorganized mass of parenchymatous tissue with metastomatic loci. It lacks any organized structure but may show restricted cellular differentiation, largely tracheal cells. It can be induced for, from any differentiated tissue and may show heterogeneity as it can be derived from different explants uh, of a plant. And it's more in case of chimeras because depending on which cell, whether it's a green cell or a white cell, you can get all together a different type of callus. Now, depending on the explant and the media constituents, variations in terms of color, texture, compactness, and even chemical composition are reported. And broadly, cali can be classified as compact, friable, dry, wet, light, dark, and so on. And interestingly, all these forms are interchangeable and different types can be observed by changing the media constituents. They also change with passage of time in culture and so on. The cali can be multiplied indefinitely as unorganized tissue through periodic subculture of three to four week duration on fresh media of similar composition. By manipulating culture media organized structures such as shoot buds, embryos, roots may be differentiated. Now the callus, there are two kinds of callus. One is the fast growing one and that is what we multiply through periodic subculture. And that media is different from when we take it to another media. And let me tell you the same callus depending on the media can either give rise to shoot buds or somatic embryos. And these structures again because then there are two stages one is the differentiation media and the other one where you can take them to maturity or in the elongated form. So you keep on changing the media to get a particular response. Now I will also like to mention that callus is something which is not just in cultures that you can induce. They do happen in nature otherwise. And there are many factors responsible for it. For example, disturbance in the endogenous growth regulator level caused by infection, insect injury that causes insect galls, soil bacterium bacillus thuringiensis that causes crown gall disease, and specific genetic combinations that cause genetic tumors. Potentially, callus can be induced from any cell or tissue of a plant. As I said earlier, it is that you make a differentiated cell de-differentiate and it can be multiplied indefinitely by routine subculture. However, in many a times there is potential loss of morphogenesis. So older the callus is, more difficult it becomes for organogenesis. It may, it again varies from species to species. 
normally for callus multiplication, we require auxin in the media and on auxin media, they fail to regenerate shoot buds. So you have to transfer them to a fresh media which is rich in cytokinins with or without auxin. You still may require a small dose of auxin. And it can also be that if you give higher dose of auxin, you require much, much higher doses of cytokinins. And many a times the repeated subculturing of the callus cells, callus, it results in habituation. And what do you mean by habituation? And that is that the cells does not require auxin's presence any further. So it synthesizes its own auxin and then you can multiply it on auxin free media. And this is an irreversible change. So once the cell has become habituated, it's habituated forever thereafter. Callus cultures, they have many applications. First of all, you can think of getting single cells by raising suspension culture so that your plant will have single cell origin. It's a very good method for getting secondary metabolites because what is happening today for most of the medicinal plants you require they you get the secondary metabolite even from organs like root and you can't always sacrifice a plant to collect that secondary metabolite but you can generate the same secondary metabolites in callus cultures in liquid cultures suspension cultures and so on so it is possible to get secondary metabolites by this method another very uh, good application of this method is to induce soma clonal variation. The plants which are vegetatively propagated, and I'll just give you one example, that is banana, where there is no natural resistance for bacterial infection. So there are possibilities that you induce this variation through suspension cultures. You treat them with mutagens, and then the plants arising out of it, they might be resistant to fusidium. But then, of course, this is another area of research and many soma clones of that kind of commercial importance have been released. This also provides a very good system for studying morphological and physiological studies. Now, what are the different stages in callus growth? So, there are five well-defined stages. When you start with the callus, the initial phase is slow, what we call as lag phase. Then it picks up growth, that is the exponential phase. And then growth stabilizes a bit, but still it keeps on multiplying, that's the linear growth phase. And thereafter, it is deceleration phase, that is when the growth phase that starts declining. And then the last is the stationary phase. Now, in the stationary phase, the cell number and volume that becomes constant. Now, if you want your cells to grow continuously, you can't afford that because every time it is that, okay, it, is, it has reached the, the stage where it, has, it stops growing. So, either you transfer them to a fresh media or you change conditions over there. So we classify them broadly into two types. One is the continuous suspension culture in which what you are doing is that you want the cells to remain in the exponential phase forever. Like uh, in theory, it is possible that you are saying let the cells grow continuously. And you can do it by two methods. One is the closed continuous culture and the other one is the open continuous culture. In closed culture, what you are doing is that you remove some of the media and replace with the fresh media. The cells from the media that you have taken out, you separate it out and put it back. Now your removal can be continuous or it can be periodic. So this way what you are getting is that you are getting, you are putting the cells back so you are making it more, uh, you can say uh, density becomes higher. But you are also replenishing fresh media because what happens is anything which grows that takes media, that requires nutrients. So to avoid 
nutrient becoming a limiting factor, you go for closed continuous culture. There is another method where what you do is you standardize the optimal cell density. So, what you are doing is that you are removing media along with the cells at fixed intervals and replenishing it with fresh media. So, when you replenish it with fresh media, again it picks up growth, there is fresh media. So, you are growing your culture at an optimal density. So, duration, volume, all that is decided by, it, is dictated by what is the optimal cell density. So, once it exceeds that, you take it out and you replenish fresh media into it. Now, media plays an extremely important role in cell culture, which is true, as I have said earlier, that it's true in any tissue culture. But what we are doing here, because it's in liquid, it is growing very fast. What it requires is nutrients like phosphorus. It requires growth regulators, both oxygen cytokinin. We give complex adjuvants such as casein hydrolysate, uh, coconut milk, yeast extract, and so on. And all this is to achieve cell density of 5 into 10 to the power 4 cells per ml or higher. Why this density is important? Because anything below this is not going to be commercially viable. So, you must maintain or you must get these densities when you say now I have optimized the media. Now, another thing which is extremely important in cell culture is that you will have cells in different phases of growth because they all are multiplying all the time. This is what you require. But if your objective is to get a secondary metabolite, what you require because what happens in case of secondary metabolization is that it is accumulation at a particular growth phase. So, if you have cells at different stages of growth, your total harvesting of the active principle will be far lower than if you can have all cells at the same stage. So, therefore, you follow other principles, you follow other technologies such as that you restrict the growth after a certain phase. So, when the cells reaches that phase of growth, they don't grow any further. So, that is what we call synchronization of cell division and we arrest growth either at G1 and G2 phase of cell development. To decide that cell culture is optimized or how do you measure cell growth? The growth in cell cultures is measured by parameters such as cell counting, pack cell volume, cell fresh weight, cell dry weight, and many other methods depending on what your objective is. Now, I'll just share with you what we are we also do with other species. I'll also go back to uh, algae, which is uh, you can say it's uh, eukaryotic cells, and that is becoming. I'm taking that example because that is becoming extremely important today, both for the production of biofuels as well as nutraceuticals. So, over here, what you ultimately need is what is it I am getting out of it? What is the fresh weight of algae? How much dry weight I am getting out of it? I do not want because cells can have as much as 90 to 95 percent volume. So, then what is the dry weight of it? And then most importantly is at that stage when I am harvesting, am I getting the right quantities of nutraceuticals? Many of them are induced due to stress. So, we also have to create that kind of stress before we collect uh, or we harvest uh, cells. Now, how do we grow these cells? The idea about the idea of growing cells or rather we got the technology from microbial studies because microbes are grown in bioreactors and sa same thing has been replicated for culture of single cells. Why these work? Because single cells again they are microscopic, they are as small or they are comparable to the microbes in that stage. For large scale cell culture, bioreactors 
of varying nature has been designed. Bioreactor is nothing as, but a glass or steel vessel which is fitted with instruments to monitor pH, temperature, dissolved oxygen, etc. on a continuous basis. It also has provision to allow sampling of cultures, add fresh media, add other nutrients, adjust pH, air supply and so on. Now, one of the most important things that one must take care of or where the losses may occur is contamination. That's a major problem in bioreactors and may cause serious losses. In recent years, bioreactors have been designed so as one can grow cultures which are mixotropic or autotropic in nature. The design of the bioreactor initially came from the designs which we are using for microbes. And therefore, light was never a feature in earlier bioreactors. But today, we want to use bioreactors for various purposes. And that has led to the invention of photobioreactors as well. Plant cells being sensitive to stress, they are usually kept at low agitation speed. You need radiation and therefore you must move your cultures all the time. There are problems associated with extracellular polysaccharides, fatty acids, high sugar content, which may also result in problems such as frothing, foaming, and so on. Many a times the cells, they get trapped in the foam and eventually die. Now, it is not death of a cell, but it is that if you have dead cells, they set in senescence and your entire culture can go bad with the death of few plants. Some of these problems have been offset by the use of anti-foam agents, but many a times you are still struggling. The other problem is stickiness because you have these tubes where the media keeps on media along with the cells keeps on moving. But since cells are comparatively heavier, they have tendency to settle along the sides of the tube. So how do you clean those? So that still remains problem in many photobioreactors or bioreactors that have been designed. Bioreactors have been designed for large scale culture of organized structures as well, such as hairy root culture for production of secondary metabolites, potato tuber production, bulblet production in lilium, plantlet production in banana. I'll also like to mention that the plants produced in photobioreactors because you there is less of handling by the human beings. You can maintain them for a long time. The plantlet cost gets reduced. But I'm also told, although I don't have first-hand experience, but I'm told that in case of banana, if you produce plantlet through photobioreactors, it becomes very difficult to transplant them because they are Shoots are arising from different positions and so on. So it is very important for you to decide what kind of photobioreactor, how much of growth regulator is to be given, when to transplant them. Maybe small tiny plants are better or maybe the last stage you take them in culture and thereafter transfer them to the outside environment. Tissue cultures also provide a unique opportunity to grow single cells in culture. And you can study the effect of various chemicals, environment influence on the cellular response, etc. by culturing them. Further, cloning of single cell permits use of techniques of microbial genetics to higher organisms as well as identification of induced or spontaneous mutants. Single cells can be isolated either from the intake plant, that is usually from the leaf tissue or from the fine suspension cultures. The cells of middle lamella, mesophyll or parenchymata cells can be either isolated mechanically by scraping of cells or enzymatically through application of mesirozyme or from the suspension culture produced by friable calli. There are large number of techniques for growing single cells. And let me tell you, culture of single cells is not easy and many a times they fail to grow. The techniques which have been developed include filter paper raft nurse technique, microchamber technique, Bergman cell plating technique, and microdrop method. Bergman cell planting technique, it involves that 
you have self suspension culture you let it pass through a filter so that it in suspension you are getting rid of larger cell aggregates and you have single cell what you do is you spread it along with almost 50% volume of this and 50% of molten agar so you spread it together so that these single cells they spread further and you can get colonies of single cell originating on that molten agar and this suspension culture mix so students in this module you have learned how we can get single cell cultures what is their importance how do we define conditions for its growth explant plays a very important role the growth media is equally important which needs to be defined it is expected as well because over here the explant is negligible over here you are dealing with isolated single cells and you have to understand what do they require for their growth their response varies depending on what kind of media you are using and thereafter what are the technologies for growing them on large scale bioreactors which initially were designed for microorganisms they have been successfully utilized for culture of cells but over a period of time we had to refine them to ensure that we can grow mixotropic as well as photoautotrophic cultures in those contamination remains a major problem in photobioreactors which needs to be overcome there are other problems associated such as settling of cells you want to ensure that those cells are remain in the dividing stage and therefore what method of uh, putting uh, more media or you maintain the same cell density because your objective is that the cells remain in the exponential phase of growth you also have to uh, synchronize growth of cells especially when your objective is to produce secondary metabolites you want the same phase of growth for accumulation of active principles you have also learnt in this module that the requirements for growing the single cells they are met by different technologies habituated callus cells can play a very important role you just put a filter paper on top of it and make the single cell grow you also have other technologies uh, which are available for growing single cells that have been successfully applied but let me also share with you that in spite of all these advancements in spite of developing various conditions for the growth of cells and its practical applications for studying basic principles of life it is still problematic to get single cell suspension cultures for many species it is also a challenge to keep them in the phase of active growth in the exponential phase synchronization remains a problem for many species and more research is needed i'm telling you all these points because i'm sure many of you will do for further research and you should know where you can spend your energies there are lot of unanswered questions our objective in long run is that we should be able to grow cultures uh, continuously at low price and use them both for improving plants as well as for cloning plants thank you very much